Well, good morning. How are you feeling this morning? We're good? We're ready for the Word of God? Yeah, awesome. We are going to be continuing our series from the book of Proverbs and looking at wisdom for living. And so over the course of the next term, we are going to be unpacking a number of different topics with you. And this morning, I wanna dive straight into the Word because I'm going to be speaking around the topic of friendship this morning, friendship. Proverbs has a lot to say about friendship because who knows that it is important that we have fruitful and prospering friendships in our life, amen. Who knows that we serve a God that desires designed us for relationship. Even looking back at the book of Genesis, when He created man, He saw that it wasn't good that man was alone. And so He created a helper. We are designed for relationships. We are designed for community. And when God birthed the church, there was this idea of the fellowship, the gathering of the saints together. And I believe that as we have thriving and healthy friendships, we have a thriving and healthy church, amen. And so it's important we understand the value of having healthy friendships. And so the title of my message this morning is very simple. It's six keys to healthy friendships. (laughs) And I've used the word friend as an acronym this morning, basically because I think it's cool when people do that. So that's where we're going this morning. So we're going to dive straight in. In Proverbs 17 verse 9, it says this, Love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. And so the first key to healthy friendship this morning is forgiveness. It's forgiveness. I wanted to start here because forgiveness is one of the foundations of a healthy friendship. Forgiveness determines whether a friendship is going to continue or whether it doesn't. And quite often when we are faced, when we're dealing with people, we know people aren't perfect. When we start getting close to people, we know people aren't perfect. And sometimes we can find ourselves in situations and circumstances where maybe we've been let down. Maybe we've had broken trust. Maybe we've had uh, unmet expectations. And we find ourselves sometimes feeling hurt and offended. And what happens when we dwell on these things is we start to build a wall around our heart, which makes it hard for others to be let in. And I wanna remind us this morning, church, that we weren't created to live a life of isolation within the walls of our pain, but we are created for community and relationship. And so it's important we understand that forgiveness is one of the keys we need for healthy friendships. And here's the good news. The Holy Spirit is able to minister to our hearts even in those places where we feel so broken because He wants to see us free. We need to understand the power of forgiveness in our friendships. Proverbs 25, verse 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. You know, a number of years ago, uh, I have a family friend who's still part of my life, but we went through a bit of a rough season. And we went through the same sort of stage of life where we were both, you know, getting boyfriends who are both now our husbands. uh, And we were getting engaged at the same time and getting married around the same time, having kids around the same time. And so we would always find ourselves kind of within the same social situations. And so I spent a lot of time with her and, you know, I sort of started noticing after a little while that there was kind of this like unsaid awkward tension that was kind of starting to build between us. And, you know, nothing was said or done, but it was just getting a bit awkward. And sometimes females can be really strange characters, okay? So anyway, um, I sort of started noticing something was a bit off and I thought to myself, you know what? I'm the sort of person I like to kind of, you know, air everything out. And so I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to go and have a conversation with her and, you know, confront the problem. And so I gave her a call and I said, hey, are you free? I'm going to pop over. Let's have a coffee and a chat. So I went to her house and uh, I went in, you know, totally with the right intention to have some sort of resolve. Uh, And so I sat there and basically listened to her tell me all of these things that I had done that had upset her and unbeknownst to me. And, you know, that's sometimes what does happen. And uh, so she walked away from that conversation feeling really, really good. You know, she's released. She's like, awesome. Thank you so much for coming to see me, Ash. And I didn't walk away feeling like that. So it's, it's actually amazing how quickly a wall of offence can come up. Because from the drive home, which was about five minutes, I had got in my car and I had not only built a wall, but the Great Wall of China around my heart. 
And in that five minute drive, I was, you know, driving past and thinking of all the sassy comebacks I should have said. You do that, you leave a conversation, you're like, I should have said that. And that's what I was doing. And I allowed the seed of offence to take root in a matter of five minutes. And so it left me, it totally eroded everything away from me. It stole my joy. It stole my peace. And I held on to this thing because I felt justified in my offence. And uh, it, it started to rob from me. And I, I looked like that person that had sucked on lemons. You know that one? We can all tell who they are. But our God is the great restorer. And so it's important that we remember that we have a God who is able to restore even the hardest things. And so what happened was I was driving past her house again. This was quite a few months on and I was eating, you know, sucking on my lemons. And uh, the Lord said to me, He said, Ash, we're going to build a bridge. We're going to build a bridge and we're going to get over it. And I thought, great, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and He's going to deliver me from this offence and I'm just going to feel fine. And that's not what happened. But what did happen was He said to me, every time you think of her or the situation, when that awful feeling comes up, I want you to respond with a random act of kindness. And you know when it's God, when you know it's not you. And so that's what I did. And so every time she would come up and I'd think about it, I'd, I'd do a random act of kindness. And it, it started off as, you know, a text message, but with no emojis, okay, just full stop. So we're not doing emojis. And I did that for a while and then the emojis started to come and it's the little kissy faces and the love hearts. Janet loves the uh, purple love hearts. And uh, anyway, so after a while, I started noticing it came up again. And I thought to myself one day, I thought, oh, the sting's not there anymore. And God had dealt with my offence. You see, I was killing her with kindness, but He was killing in me the root that it caused. It's important we understand the power of forgiveness in our relationships. The second thing is this. We need to build friendships that remain in every season. Remain in every season. One of the keys in Proverbs 11 verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Now, my husband, Nathan, is a gardener and I am not, okay? Glenn O'Brien's a gardener. He's got a whole YouTube channel. You should follow him. We love Glenn. You know, you come to my house and it's filled with fake plants. Where are my fake plant people? Where are you? Yes, you're my people. I see that hand. But what I do know about gardening is this. When you plant a seed in the ground, to see it reach its full potential and maturity, it needs the right kind of conditions to grow. It needs water, covering and protection from weather conditions. It needs light and shade and nutrients in the soil. And when all of these conditions are available, the tree can grow healthy and strong with roots that go deep. The tree flourishes and brings fruit. You know, everything can look good on the surface of a tree, but you can really tell the health of it when you pull up the root system. You can see whether the foundation of what that's been planted on is actually healthy or not. You can tell by the root system. And in the same way with our friendships, when a seed of friendship is sown, it needs the right kind of conditions to reach its full potential in God. And the good news is, is that we have everything we need for healthy and thriving friendships through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, my Bible says in John 7, that out of our hearts will flow rivers of living water. When people spend time with us, we wanna be the kind of friend that leave people feeling refreshed, rivers of living water. We have the Word of God, which is life to our bones. We can cover each other with prayer and protection. We need to sow seeds of hope with our words. We need to grow strong and mature trees of friendship in our lives because when the storms of life come, I have strong and mature trees around me that I can go back and taste of the fruit in every season and it is good for my soul. We need to build friendships like this. In Psalm 1 verse 3, it says, He who is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. Let's build friendships that remain in every season and let's build strong and healthy trees in the right kind of conditions. Amen. The next thing is this. The next key to healthy friendship is it starts with an invitation. 
Proverbs 9, verse 1 to 5. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewed her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts and has mixed her wine. And I love this part. And she has also set the table. That just sounds like a woman getting ready for Sunday lunch, doesn't it? She has also set her table. I want to speak to you for a moment about our table setting. We heard from Ben this morning, and I love it when God does this. We need to look at what we're setting our table with and who we're inviting. You know, something Nathan and I love to do is we love to have people in our home. And a number of years ago, we ran a young adults connect group. That's where we first really connected with Ricky and Evan back there. And uh, the highlight of my Tuesday was wondering whether I'm gonna beat Scott Blakemore in Rummy Cub this week or whether I'm not. And I can honestly say hand on heart that after three years, I think we bet him twice, but it was sweet. And, uh, you know, and we love the friendly banter. We love, you know, the fun and the silliness and everything that happens within our home. There's something powerful about the connections that we build in our house. When we invite people to our table, you see our table, it's set differently to the things of this world. Our table is set with the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, except when playing rummy cub, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. A place for people to taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, one thing that I love about our church is that we have connect groups. And I just want to say this, connect groups isn't something that we just tag onto the end of our our Sunday services. Connect groups are intentional. Connect groups are a place to attend, to feel intentional connection. It's a safe place to enjoy company and a place to feel safe and known. And I love hearing the testimonies that come out of these connect groups. You can speak to any of our leaders, but that is a place where we can come Within, within a home and feel connected in. And so I encourage you, if you aren't in one, I would love to connect you into the life of our incredible church because it's a place where we can grow. It's a place where we can have community, healthy community. You know, Jesus himself understood the value of deep connection with friends. What was he doing on the night before he went to the cross? We know it as the Last Supper. He was sharing a meal around the table of 12 of his closest friends, sharing a meal. He understands the power of these connections. You know, in a society that is so fast paced and everything is technology driven, we need to take hold of these principles and apply them to have healthy friendships. We need eyes to see each other, hearts that are moved with compassion and homes that are open We need to set the table, church, because here's the thing. People are looking for something out there that the world can't offer them. And when they come into the Lord's house and He sets the table, everyone gets a seat. Everyone is welcome into the Lord's house, but it starts with an invitation. When the lost and lonely come into the house of God, we are seen and we are known. Everyone is invited for a seat in the Father's house. And so my question is, who are you inviting for dinner? We have the answer. The next thing is this. Healthy friendships are built on encouragement. I really wanted to highlight the way we speak in this point this morning. In Proverbs 22 verse 11, it says, He who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as his friend. Our words are creative. They have the power to build up or tear down. In Proverbs 18, 21, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. We need to be the kind of friend that speaks life. Amen. We need to be those people. We need to surround ourselves with people who are going to bring out the best version of you. Friends who are going to remind us, remind us of who we are when we lose sight. Reveal truth when we start believing lies. Pray for us when we need covering and sow seeds of hope. You know, there's this famous quote and it, you'll know it. It says, everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. 
I want to propose an argument that this fish was being judged by its ability to do something it wasn't created for. It was listening to the wrong kinds of voices. We need to surround ourselves with people who are encouraging us to do the right things. They're the people we need in our life. Proverbs 12, 26, the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. And the reality is, is that sometimes we can find ourselves. sometimes it's not our own doing, but in friendship circles that actually aren't built on these principles. We can find ourselves that sometimes we're, you know, a part of uh, tearing people down or gossip and slander. And in Proverbs 20 verse 19, it, it gives us a warning. It said, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a simple babbler. People that just like to talk, you know, those ones. But as Christians, we are called to shift atmospheres. We are not called to conform to the pattern of this world. We are called to bring the fragrance of Christ. A number of years ago when I had babies and uh, I've got three boys and I was going to a mother's group and it wasn't part of this church, it's all good. Uh, and I was going along and uh, the, the nature of this group was honestly just quite toxic. And there'd be a lot of just, you know, talking about people and whinging all the time. And anyway, after going for a little while, I, saw, I, I left going, I really don't feel good about going. And so I decided that I wasn't going to attend anymore. And after a few weeks, the lady that was running the group, she called me and she said, hey, Ash, like, haven't seen you in a little while. And and uh, we had a conversation. And I knew that I, if I had crossed a line that day, because I, d- I decided to tell her what my issue was with, with the group, like I do. And uh, I, I, I knew that I was going to cross the line because if, if I was about to tell her what I really thought, I was probably not ever going to be welcomed back to that group again, but also probably lose some friendships in, the, in that process. But I chose to cross the line that day because I chose the fear of God over the fear of man. And I made the decision that doing what was right far outweighed my desire to be liked or accepted by people who were doing the wrong thing. And sometimes we're faced where we need to be those people that cross that line because we need to reveal the kingdom of God and gossip and slander and friendships that are built on that foundation are not good for us. We need to be a part of people. In Proverbs 16, 24, it says this, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. Let's be those people. Let's surround ourselves with those people. Let's be them and let's surround ourselves with them. Let's build friendships on encouragement. The next thing is this, the letter N. Are you following my my word? I'm, I'm spelling friend. Is everyone following? We'll get there. I feel so clever. Um, The letter N, not afraid to bring correction. Proverbs 27 verse 9, perfume and incense bring joy to the heart and the pleasantness of a friend springs from heartfelt advice. Correction is an opportunity to grow. You know, Pastor Ben touched on this a couple of weeks ago. Wisdom is humility and teachability. And friendship is a gift where we get to remove the masks and we get to be our unfiltered self and show people who we really are. And with that also comes blind spots that we don't see. And it's important we have friends and people in our life that we allow close enough to bring correction and things to our attention when we need it. It's important that we have those people. Do we like hearing it? No. (laughs) Do we need to hear it? Probably, yeah. In Proverbs 19, verse 20, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. A number of months ago, um, I went shopping with my friend who happens to be sitting in the front row and uh, I'm not naming names, but we went into uh, Country Road and I don't even know if she remembers this story, but I forgive you, it's fine. Uh, we went into uh, Country Road and I was trying on a top and, you know, I'm, I don't know what guys do, but girls have this code where, you know, when you try something on, you always want to know, you take that friend who'll tell you what they really think, okay? And so I tried on this top and I'm feeling quite good. I'm thinking, this is really working for me. It wasn't this one, uh, but I'm thinking, this is really working. And I sort of, you know, parade myself out of the uh, change room and I'm like, so what do you think? 
And she looked at me and she said, I think it makes you look a bit big. I think it makes you look two sizes bigger than what you are. And in that moment, I didn't know whether I wanted to be her friend anymore um, or whether I was, you know, thankful for her advice. But what I can tell you is that I didn't walk out of the store with that top that day because even though I thought it looked good, it didn't. And we need people in our lives who will say, hey, Ash, you know how you responded to that? That probably wasn't the best way to do it. Maybe try this. Or, hey, Ash, you know how, you know, you said this thing about that person? That's probably not what you should be doing. We need people close enough to bring us accountability and correction because it helps us grow. In Proverbs 27, verse 17, it talks about iron sharpens iron. I love this. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. You know, there's this mutual benefit. When I was researching iron sharpens iron, there's this mutual thing that happens where when both pieces of iron are, you know, hitting against each other with friction, it creates a heat. And there's not one that's left blunt. They actually sharpen at exactly the same time, at exactly the same rate, because they're working in the same direction. And I don't know about you, but I want to be sharp for God. I want people in my world who are going to sharpen me. I want to be that person who sharpens others. And so we need those iron sharpens iron kinds of friends. I want to be able to cut away things in my life that God doesn't want there. I want to be able to separate spirit and flesh. Hear the voice of the Holy Spirit when He prompts me and pierce through the hearts of people to reveal Jesus. We need to be sharp. And we need to have those iron sharpened iron kinds of people. We need to be them and we need to surround ourselves with them. Amen. In 1 Thessalonians, friends, friends encourage us to our highest good. Let's build friendships that call us to the highest good, who aren't afraid to bring correction and who sharpen us for the things of God. Amen. Are you with me, church? I'm going to invite the worship team up. The last point is this, we're ending with D, because friend ends with D. Direct us to Jesus. Healthy friendships direct us to Jesus. In Proverbs 18, verse 24, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Friendship with us should lead people closer to Christ. We carry everything we need to have friendships that are fruitful and healthy. We have the fragrance of Christ and the power of His Spirit living within us. We have everything that we need. We need people in our world to know that Jesus is the answer. And our mission is to reveal Jesus to a lost and a broken world and lead them to the house of God into the arms of a loving Saviour. People are looking for something that this world can't offer. And through us, we have the answer and His name is Jesus. You know, when Pastor Ben launched this, this series and we were talking about topics that we could do, friendship stood out to me. And as I was preparing this message for you today, the Lord reminded me of my salvation story. I gotta get through this without crying, okay? I, uh, I wasn't brought up in a Christian home. Uh, my, my home life was very dysfunctional. And there was a lot of different kinds of abuse and lots of different things that were happening. And uh, I was a 16 year old girl who'd thrown, her, thrown herself into, you know, striving and wanting to be the best. I was a national netballer. I was the head prefect. I was, I got A's and A pluses in all of my work. And I was, I was throwing myself into something that wasn't filling the void in my life that I had. And at the age of 16, I, I also was throwing myself into alcohol and drugs and everything that went along with that too. And I remember, you know, waking up after a, a party the next morning, coming in and out of consciousness, and I had no recollection of what had happened the night before. And uh, I looked up to the sky. This sounds so cliche, but this is my story. I looked up to the sky and I said to God, God, if You're real, I wanna know You and I wanna give my life to You. 
because I knew that the life that I was living, it didn't fit me. I knew that there was something more to my life, but I didn't know how to find it. I didn't know what to do. I had no one showing me. I didn't own a Bible. But God found me on that back lawn that night, that day. And so one month later, there was a family that started at my school and there were two brothers and then they knew one of the girls in my grade and they also knew another boy. So there's four of them. And I just, I was watching and I was just observing because there was something about them that just hit different. And I didn't know what it was until one day, one of them said to me, hey, Ash, do you wanna come to youth on Friday night? And something in me just said, yes, I do. And I didn't know what I was getting myself in for, but I wanted to go because there was something that was drawing me in. And so I went along. And I stepped into the house of God for the first time as a 16 year old broken girl. And in that moment, everything made sense because I had come home. I'd come home to the house of God that had a table that was set for me at the Father's table. You know, I wanted to land my message here because my salvation story was found through friendship. It was because someone offered me an invitation to be my friend and to invite me into the house of God. They loved me that much that they would introduce me to who they knew as God. And so I found myself in the house of God 20 years on and I haven't looked back. We need to be these people to a lost and a dying world. And so this morning, I want you to stand to your feet. There's a few areas that I want us to specifically pray for this morning. We are going to open the altar and you can respond at any time to anything, but I really wanted to pray for people that when I was speaking about forgiveness, you know that you're holding an offence against a friend and it hurts. I don't want you to leave this building today without dealing with that. God wants to minister to you this morning in that place. The Holy Spirit just very gently wants to come and touch you. And here's the thing about forgiveness. When we choose to forgive, we're not saying that what they did was okay. We're not validating it. But what we're saying is, God, I don't want the bondage anymore. I don't wanna lose my peace and my joy over this anymore. I wanna be free. And so as we release forgiveness, He comes. And so if that's you this morning, I'm gonna invite the care team forward. I want you to respond. The second group of people I wanna pray for are those that feel lonely where you can walk into a crowded room and you feel like no one sees you and no one knows you. I wanna tell you that in the Father's house, you are seen and you are known by our Heavenly Father. And He invites you into this place. You have a seat at the table. And finally, friends, I wanna pray for souls. I wanna pray for the lost. I believe we're stepping into a harvest season as a church where we're going to see the lost come home, where we're gonna see souls, we're gonna see salvation in the life of this church. The harvest is ready and it's ripe. And so we need to intercede for our friends and our family. You know, the Lord may even be highlighting someone to you right now and you know that they need to come home. And so at church, wherever you're standing, I just want you to start praying. I want you to start interceding. And if if the Lord lays someone on your heart, I want you to come and respond and we can pray together for them because we're gonna see the lost come home. Amen. Do you believe it this morning, church? He's a good God. Amen. And so the team's gonna worship for a little while longer. And we're gonna pray. And we're gonna believe God for your breakthrough this morning. In Jesus' Name.